Good morning. Mora Kozi. That is thank you. The one word I learned in Kenya Rwanda. And um, it's thank you. And we're just so grateful to our church. Grateful for how you support us in prayer and how you support the church in Rwanda. And so we want to show you some pictures. So I'm going to reach into the pocket of my lovely new Rwanda dress. Don't you love a dress with pockets? Pat, don't you love that? Okay. Please don't begin to. <laughs> okay, look at that. Rwanda trip review. Arnie and Sharon Armstrong. I'll introduce my husband. This is Arnie. I guess you didn't get the memo that you're supposed to wear matching clothes today? Let me explain the, I'll explain the, the country. The west, that is the Congo, okay? Beside the lake. Yep, on the, on the other side of the lake. South of Rwanda, that's Burundi. Burundi. Burundi used to be part of Rwanda, okay? If you go north, that's Uganda, okay? And north of, if you go north to the right, that's Kenya. If you go south, and over to the right a little bit, that's Tanzania. There's a lot of people living here. Like Tanzania, for example, alone has 80 million people. 80 million. And it's not even the size of Saskatchewan, okay? Uh, Rwanda has 15 million, and it's a postage stamp. It's like, I don't know, I think you could put 30 of them or something. You could put a lot of them just in Saskatchewan and there's 15 million. It's the most densely populated country in Africa. Okay, so the people are the most important thing about Rwanda for Arnie and myself. Uh, these are just kids. Um, I asked them if I could take a picture of them and they just love seeing themselves on my, my phone. Um, you can tell they do not have a lot of money. You can tell by all the toys that they're playing with that they don't have a lot of money. Uh, Flip-flops are, are the, the shoes of choice. And I just loved, loved being with the children. Uh, one day I, well, I'll, I'll tell you about that later. This is the first time we've seen this PowerPoint. Thank you so much, Pastor Eli. He scrambled to get this all done for us last night. So thank you very much. Okay, you can see in the back uh, sign, Gagali International Airport. We have arrived. This is, um, Gagali is the capital of Rwanda. So this is just a view of Rwanda. You can see um, there's a lot of new buildings there. The infrastructure, they've just really organized it well. Uh, we've mentioned that last year that it's a safe country. It's a very clean country. Can you see, sort of on the left, you see a pointy little building? That is um, kind of a replica of uh, gift baskets that people use. So that's... Um, Put them on their head, and you'll see women walking for weddings, funerals. Births. The, it's a lid and you put um, usually food in there and you carry it on your head to your friend's house. So there's all different kinds of houses there. There's big, new, beautiful homes. In the foreground, you'll see that, yep, just uh, whatever pieces of uh, materials they can find, building materials, they put together a place to live where they can keep the rain off. This is a countryside. You can see on the right in the back, um, hills. It's hills, 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 mountains, beautiful. Um, it's a very temperate climate. Um, I teased uh, one of my friends on Facebook because apparently you guys have been having a heat wave here. And uh, 
Yeah, and we are in hot Africa suffering for Jesus with uh, in a temperate climate that it got a high of 25 degrees. So, yeah. So, so sorry about that. But, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just explain a little bit. Anytime you saw water, irrigation was done not so much like we do it here with our um, pipes, but someone takes a bucket and scoops water wherever they can find it and throws it onto the field. So Kelsey, you might want to do that this, this year. As you can see, they build houses everywhere. It doesn't need to have a road there. Um, most people walk and there's little paths everywhere. So 1%, I think, of the population have a vehicle, and uh, so walking or bicycles. Some have um, motorcycles, but yeah, you don't need roads to get to your house. Taxis, uh, the most common taxi is a motorbike. Yeah, if you see somebody driving a motorcycle with a red helmet, uh, you can wave them down, because that's a taxi. This is the highway, and it's, uh, it's mountains, so it's just curved like this the whole way up and down and curved. But you can see on the left-hand side there, they have a very nice walkway because people have bikes, they walk, and so the government has done a really good job with the infrastructure for the highway. And we get to follow all kinds of loads there that you wonder if they're going to make it. Yeah, but it's like the Autobahn. They have a, a really high speed limit of 60 kilometers an hour. <laughs> and they have cameras everywhere. The government put cameras everywhere in the trees. And so they take it to you uh, like race. That's how they, I think, race taxes. But <laughs> okay, so this, you need to be a little bit of a Millerite to understand this. Um, one of our, well, the director of our campus in Sunnybrae in British Columbia, he started a business with coffee and he calls it Reverend Coffee. So he was there teaching um, a few months ago and the pastor asked, the pastor on the right there, Pastor John, asked, can we use that name? And so Steve said, sure. And they took this building and they revamped it, renovated it into a cafe, called it Reverend Coffee. They have smoothies there with real fruit and, um, and pastries. So I happen to stop there once a day. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, one of the real uh, needs is employment. And so um, those young people are actually part of a ministry team, very strong music team. And, uh, and so that... Uh, business that uh, that's John that's the head of the entire operation that uh, he's the head bishop of the nine church plants in Rwanda and many also in Kenya Tanzania and other places so he's he's a big deal his dad planted 400 churches okay so he's he's a big deal he's a big man too but um, so what he did is he he said, I, I don't want these young people to leave. They'll leave. They'll go to Kigali and they'll just fall away. And I, I need them. So he built this business. And he's thinking of doing this all over Rwanda. So the churches that get these new young people saved, these are mostly new converts. They stay in the churches. Uh, they work for about $3 a day. That's about, and, but they sometimes get twice that in tips. And nothing like going to a coffee shop when you have 20 young people, all big smiles and love the Lord, right? And they see it as a ministry. So it's their chance also to share their faith. And so this is a great tool. The, the, the fella, one of the fellows that John led to Christ, his name is Emmy, Emmy, short for Emmanuel. He's unbelievably talented. And he did all the furniture, all the tile work, everything the, of the whole building. The, the, the structure. And he did that, again, for... Um, three dollars a day willing to do that so that the ministry moves forward so very exciting 
And not only is Emmy talented and is using his skills for God, but he is training other young people and passing on his skills so that they will be employable too. So. Yeah, he's teaching welding and he's teaching how to do tile. He's teaching how to, like, he's got skills. Woodwork. Woodwork. And so build furniture. And so, uh, yeah, so it's very important that the Rwandan church, that the young people have employment. Otherwise, what happens in young Rwanda, people get to this age, they finish high school, there's no employment. You just sit on a bench and watch cars go by or whatever. And so that's just not good for their souls. And so Pastor John said that even if they just break even, that it's just really beneficial to the church and the community. So this is um, a bus. And I think in this bus, there's 14 to 16 people. So if, if, if you get stranded in Rwanda and need to get someplace. John told me, <laughs> and you saw how big John is. He said he was in one of those once, and there was 28 of them. <laughs> oh, man, I'm alive. It's not, he hasn't got that sense of Canadian distance that we like. <laughs> But every time the bus stops, there are people there selling donuts that you can buy. There are the bicycles. See the guy with the red helmet? Um, so they just park wherever and you go over. There's no system whatsoever. You just pick somebody and um, agree on uh, the amount. Of course, Rwandans, they know exactly how much it would cost from place to place. But for white people, they would say a price, and then you would offer them a little bit less than that, and then they kind of meet you in the middle. Motorbikes. Motorbikes. Okay, we're in church. This is a children's choir, and they are enthusiastic. So I do have videos, but... <laughs> All of them. <laughs> they pump and march and shake and clap and dance and jump. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> it's great. I love it. Yeah, and they, uh, the, the, the church offers the, the children instruments so they can learn to play instruments. And they're, they're African. So almost all Africans just have a sense of music and you just give them an instrument and without a training, they'll go onto YouTube a little bit and boom. Now all of a sudden they're playing the saxophone. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. So we showed you the shape of a, a building and this is the offering plate. And so, yeah, and that's something we should implement at our church too, because you can dance up to the front and give your offering. So, yeah, maybe next Four week. In the service. <laughs> you don't give it all at once, you just keep coming. <laughs> oh, who's that? Okay. Um, so, the fellow on the left, that's Pastor Joel, otherwise known as Joel. Um, and he was Arnie's translator, so he just does a great job. Uh, for anybody who ever took one of Arnie's Torah courses, um, you can see that something is laying on its side. Does anybody know what that is? Mount Sinai, lying on its side, is a tabernacle. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, he, he's um, blind in one eye and deaf in one ear. Yeah, during the Civil War, his uh, hand grenade was thrown into his home and took out his, his eye. Sure didn't stop him. Nope. Okay, here we are giving the offering, and we got the cute little baby on the back. And that's, that's how they carry children. There's no strollers there. There's babies on the back. And you will see um, a child half the size of an adult carrying a baby on their back. Whew, look at that. Okay, so this is my friend Zawadi. She's married to Pastor John, and she's the one who arranged for Arnie's and my ensemble. It was a gift to us. You, see, you gave money and we got the gift. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> And there is one of um, 
the baskets that they would put on their head that they would put food in to give as a gift to somebody. Love the people. Okay, so construction sites. A little different than Canadian. But uh, most of Rwanda is volcanic rock. And so you just break it with a sledgehammer. And if you want gravel, you start with a big rock and you just keep hammering it so you have some gravel. This is at the um, church. Um, they have a school there, but they keep adding another grade each year. See the school? Can you tell which is a school? And these are water tanks. That's um, water from the gutters, but a lot of times they have to haul in drinking water. And the container is about $1,000 each, so that's quite an expense to just have water at your house. There's the handmade um, chairs and desks that people have made for the classroom. The men there, uh, uh, Sorry. Both men and women. Uh, they make all their own furniture. So they, they, they uh, bring in wood, uh, they cut it down to size, they plane it, they do everything. So they basically take raw lumber and make all the furniture of all the schools. And so, yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, so um, our wonderful church here raised money to provide a textbook for the students. And so Miller College of the Bible, they paid for one of the textbooks, and you guys paid for the other textbook. And they are very happy about it. They're very excited. And I don't know if you remember last year, but um, they had asked if the book that Arnie, that we had brought last year, The Lord Has Spoken, that Arnie wrote, um, within two weeks, they had translated it into um, Kinyawande and uh, French, because English is not their first language. So it just makes it a little easier for them. Oh, there's a teacher. And the students kind of look happy still. Many of these schools speak quite a few languages. Uh, uh, Swahili, uh, English, French, um, some smaller tribal languages. Uh, many of them also speak um, Rwandan, or they call it Kiru, Kiru Rwanda. Kinyawanda. Yeah, Kiru Rwanda. Um, John has. And that's why all these churches uh, of these people who are there, they all, not only plant churches, the churches start schools. Because that is also so important. Yeah, we had talked about that last year, but some of you weren't here last year. Yeah, so. And um, so what they do, they usually start with one grade. And then next year when um, the students are in second grade, they build another uh, room for them. And they just keep adding a uh, room every year so the children can continue their education. The goal is to take them right to grade 12. And uh, some friends of ours gave um, some money so that um, the teachers who don't make a lot of money were given a little bonus at the end of this school year. Okay, and also every morning before classes, uh, they had the students give a devotional, and this is with a translation so that he could just speak in his native language and be comfortable um, with what he wanted to say. Yeah, I think he was speaking in Swahili, and that was his native language. And then this fellow here knows Swahili and English. So. The classes are all in English. But even last year, when Arnie had assignments for them, he just said, do it in your native language. Just whatever you have learned, he wanted them to be able to easily write down what they've learned. Oh, 
there's my man. Okay, so we were there in the dry season. So they have a wet season and a dry season. And temperatures stay kind of the same. But one day we just had a torrential downpour and it just rained. So you can see like there's a water tower there for some drinking water. But, and then just all kinds of different houses around the church. This was often my mode of transportation, a school bus. Uh, love the guys. They came and brought the food for lunch every day at the church. And then I got to ha get a ride back to where we were staying with a short stop at Reverend Coffee. This is the church, the friend of the church. This is the church that Arnie said has nine church plants right now. And some of Arnie's ex-students will recognize this. Now this is just a normal yard. So last year when we were there, they had three goats in there. This year they had a cow. A fellow kind of in the middle, sitting down, holding a orange Fanta. This was a a party for him. He and another one of the students uh, were going to get married and so we threw a party. Usually in Africa you bring beer. We didn't bring beer. We brought Fantas and uh, yeah just celebrated with him. We didn't understand a single thing they were saying because they were speaking in their language but it was a joyous time. Most people vast, vast majority of people do not have a pipe running to their house for water. So you see huge lineups for people, there, there'll be a tap somewhere in the village and people have to walk with their empty containers, they're almost all like these, and fill them up, they have to pay to fill them up, and then they have to walk all the way home. This young guy had three containers that he would be carrying home on very rough roads. And also, um, if you ever see a man carrying water, like you think, oh, he's the strongest, he should be the one carrying it, it's because he has nobody else that will um, look after him. He has no children, he has no wife, he has no one. He has to do it himself. So that actually is a sad thing if you see a, a man carrying water. A man Yep, two young guys, not that old, and this is all the stuff that they'll be carrying. Often they put them on bicycles, and what they do is they'll just pile it up as high as the ceiling. And then they, all they do is they kind of hold one hand on the wheel, and one to hold it steady, and the other guy's on the other side doing this thing, and they just kind of walk it up a hill that goes on for miles. And they're just literally, you can see them, they're just pushing as hard as they can to get that thing uphill. And they'll do maybe one or two hills a day. And so you go up a hill, you go down, you get rid of it, and you go back. And, but if you don't, you don't eat that day. That's, there's no savings. You, you, you don't, it's, uh, your hunger drives you to keep walking. <laughs> and they do it in sturdy flip-flops. 
So you can see these women carrying things on their head. They, one has a cell phone. She's not even touching the burden on her head. It just balances. So here's a lineup, one of the lineups. Now you can see somebody's got money and they have a bicycle so they can carry the water on the bicycle. This is one of the church plants. Now last year we had showed you pictures of this same church plant. And when we showed it to you, there is lots of people helping. And you see the very bottom of the building, the darker rock? That's lava rock. And we had told you about how people want to contribute to the church. And so they bring a rock from their um, property. Or people in the village knew it would be a good thing for their community to have a church because there'll be um, a school there as well. And so they want to be part of it and they would bring a rock. And the church people said, if all we get is a foundation, we're glad because we get to talk to the people who come here. The villagers that come and maybe bring a rock and talk to us, we get to spread the gospel. So the believers thought, you know, God is at work. We're happy with what he does. But you can see they've started to build the walls now. And uh, they it's slowed down because they only have so many cinder blocks. They're expensive. The mud bricks are less a lot less expensive, but if there's any rainy season or flooding, then it just washes away, which was what happened last year. Uh, so some of the extra money that you gave, because you gave more than what the books were, will be going to this project, okay? Um, you can't really see from this picture, but this will house a church of about 800 to 1,000, okay? And when they start, it will be full. It will be full. And so uh, there's already tremendous growth of, of uh, Bible studies in the area. And so they know it's like a four to five year goal to get the building built. By the time the building's built, um, then they'll have a celebration and the thing will be packed. Okay? And then what they'll do is uh, run that for a while. They, will, they, they build debt free. Okay? And they build debt free. Uh, interest rates in Rwanda are 12%, and they cannot afford 12%, okay? And so you've got the foundation, the next set of, of cinder blocks, they make themselves. They bring in the sand, and they make them themselves, okay? They don't buy them. They bring in truckloads and make them themselves. They'll go 14 high, then they'll put a, a, a wood beam around the, like, uh, on top of that, then they'll go another nine high, and then they'll build a steel roof over top of that. And then they'll put windows and doors in, and when they can do that, when they have windows, doors, they don't have to have a washroom, but windows, doors, and a, and a roof, then the government says, now you can formally have meetings. Okay? And so that's a very exciting, that, that's, the, that's a church plant that I suspect that building will probably be done in about a year and a half because there's already funds, significant funds, that are going to be coming towards this particular project. For doors and windows and roof, how much is that? Uh, 27,000 US. Yeah. But right now they, they need the cinder block. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of our money is going towards cinder block. The man on the right side, he's a pastor. He'll be the pastor of that church. He's one of the pastors in the big church. So what happens is he'll just hive off. How much time? How many more pictures do you have there, Eli? Eli? Okay. Um, so right now it's slowed down. They only have so many cinder blocks, so they just have um, two men working on it right now. You have five more. Oh, five more. Okay. And these are the people they're trying to reach, the people in their community, the people that are looking in um, on the church. And they're observing the church, the people, and um, a great witness that they are. Oh, I just had so much fun with the kids. They love seeing their, their picture on my phone. And there, that's what we're looking for, cinder blocks, so they can complete the walls and then put the roof, windows, and doors on. Do you have any 
questions? Sharon doesn't like answering questions. <laughs> This one, uh, these were made by a professional seamster because he came in. My last stuff, well, to be quite honest, I mean, the first time they, I was in a marketplace and they built me a shirt, it looked like I was under a tent. But this is, as you can see, it is absolutely custom. It is, I couldn't believe it. When I started it on, I thought, I'll never get in it. And all of a sudden I realized, when it's, I'm, finally I'm in it, it's like, he was perfect on his measurements. And so, yeah, so that was their gift to Sharon and I. Last time we bought our own stuff just so that we felt like we were supporting the economy and being African, but yeah. Sharon's dress was nice, but her pants were ridiculous. And my shirt was ridiculous. All the buttons fell off, you know. <laughs> but this was done by, uh, yeah, professional. Mm -hmm. This is a very typical colors, but this is being dressed up. They don't tend to, well, they, they tend to be quite plain normally, and they wear a lot of t-shirts, I was surprised. And, you know, and, but it's hot, and, and they do a lot of physical work. This is, this is geared for that. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I will use the mic. Well, turn with me. We'll just do a little bit. I'm not going to speak long, but I, I just want to celebrate, though, the concept of salvation. It is good to know that, that you're part of a faith that it doesn't matter where you go in the world, it's relevant. It doesn't matter where you go. You go into Rwanda, you talk to someone from Tanzania, you talk to someone in French in Congo, uh, you, 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 it doesn't matter where you go. Jesus died for everyone in the entire world. And he purchased a people through his blood from every tongue and nation. Some people say, you know, God's not into nations and tongues and tribes anymore. That was the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's just the world. That is not true. The book of Revelation makes it very clear that God emphatically desires to see the gospel to be embraced by thousands of languages. That brings him praise. You know, it's humbling when you're in a Rwandan church and people are praising Jesus. And you know God understands every word they're saying. And I understand the word thank you. And I can guess that that means Jesus. And a few words. A few words is like, you know, transliterated kind of words. Like, you know, and I'm like, I, what's that? Yeah, I see. Yeah, the, the, the word Christ, the word Jesus, and a few other words I recognize. But God hears his praises in, you know, about 6,000 languages in the world, of which, if you're a really clever person like John, you might know seven of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the fact that God gets praised in 6,000 languages, you know what that means? It's not about you. <laughs> I mean, you only know one of them, or two of them, or maybe if you're really clever, 20 of them. But he knows 6,000. So clearly, 
Salvation ultimately is for his praise and his glory. Because he has it in so many languages and so many different people groups. If it was about us, I think we would probably make clear that I think it should all be in English so we all can hear each other and understand when we're praising. Now when we go to heaven, there's no question that the languages will be there. But there will not be a problem understanding the, the languages. We'll have this knowledge that is far superior to even angels according to the Bible. And, and so we, we, will, we will know as we're known. And therefore we can sing to God with a multitude of the nations. And somehow, I'm not sure how that works. I haven't, as you know, died and gone to heaven and come back yet. So, uh, <laughs> but it's about him. And that, that really struck me when I was in Rwanda. Because I was in several services. And not just when they sang in Rwanda. Because sometimes what they would do, they'd sing in French. Because the, there was four or five guys that were in French uh, from the Congo. And so they'd let them... It, and they knew, most of them knew French enough to, because Rwanda used to be French. And so I would get a, I would hear praises about Jesus in French, and then I'd hear it in Rwandan, then I'd hear it in Tanzanian, and then they'd do it in English, because I did an English service there. Um, because they actually, they do a service in English, so people who want to learn English, maybe they want to learn about Jesus, but they want to learn about English, a great way to learn English is come, hear a sermon, read words on a text, and sing in English. That's a great way to practice your English. Well, it's one of the great ways they evangelize in Rwanda, is, is uh, people that don't have English, they, they'll sometimes choose to come to an English service. Um, but it reminded me the fact that, Lord, I don't even understand what's going on here. It just reminds me, yeah, it's not about you, Arne. It's like, that is so clear. It's about you. It's about you. And that is why you wanted no, it's just too small of a thing for God to just save the Hebrew people. He is the savior of the whole world. To his great glory. In chapter, um, chapter 40, Six. Chapter four, 45 of Isaiah. Chapter 45 of Isaiah. I'm just going to read a few passages that just celebrate this and we'll close our service with this, okay? Chapter 45. Chapter 45. The first verse I'm going to read is verse 4. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun from the, and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Isaiah is saying here that he's going to, he predicts 200 years in the future He's going to use a Persian king to set the people of Israel free. He, he, he names them by name. The guy's name is Koresh. He becomes one of the greatest of the Persian kings of ever, of history. And he decides that after he took over Babylon, that he let the people go. And God says, you know what? It's too small of a thing that I will use my prophet Isaiah to you, Cyrus, though you don't, you don't believe in me, but this is what you will do. I will cause you to do this. It's too small of a thing for you to just send the Jewish people home. I'm going to make you open up the prison doors for free. The people back in these countries aren't going to have to pay for any of these people ransom. And he's going to open the prison doors and all the people of all the nations who want to leave from the prison doors if you go home. And God says, who told you about this? I told you 200 years before it happened. So the nation's place. Who would have thought that the Assyrians, so cruel, never let people go home? The Babylonians followed them, never let people go home. But 
somehow God would raise up an empire and a particular king, and he would say, you want to go home? You go home. I don't go home, but I got no rich people back home that could pay for me. No, it's free. Just go home. And let them go home. The Kurds can go home. The Philistines can go home. The Moabites can go home. The Jews can go home. The Amalekites, the Amalites, the Gergeshites, the Egyptians. You want to go home? Just go home. It's free. God predicted that. Because he wanted the nations to know that it's the God of Israel who is the Savior of the whole world. He cares about everyone, not just his own people. He cares about everyone. He says this, continuing, he says, Thus says the Lord, chapter verse uh, um, 45, verse 14. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchants of, of, of Cush and the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over to you and, and be yours and, you shall, and, and shall follow you and you shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you saying, surely God is in you and there is no other, no God besides him. Here's another one, verse 15. Truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Verse 17, but Israel is saved by Yahweh with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. Verse 18, for thus says the Lord who creates the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it and established it. He did not create it to be empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh and there is no other. I did not speak in secret or in the land of darkness. Meaning, I spoke publicly to my people through my prophets what I would do, and I did it. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. You should seek me, but it won't work out. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Verse 22, uh, verse 21. Declare the present to your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Did any philosopher know that Jesus of Nazareth was coming? Did any of them talk about him? Did any of them say the Son of God was going to come and die on a tree and pay for our sins? No. No. Did any religion that worship idols tell us any of that? No. No, it came th from the Lord himself through his prophets, spoken to his people in the open, not in the dark, of what he was going to do in the future so that he would get the glory. God says this. He says, present your case. Who declared this? Who said that Persia would come to power, that a king would set the peoples free? He goes on to say this. Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. And this is quoted by Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, verse 23. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, for my mouth has gone out in righteousness. Another word for salvation. A word shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. Who is Yahweh? He is the God of Israel. Who is Yahweh? He is the true creator of the heavens and the earth. Who is Yahweh? He is the beginning and the end. Who is Yahweh? He is the first and the last. Who is Yahweh? He is the Alpha and the Omega. He tells you from the beginning what's going to happen. He tells you what's going to happen in the end because he is Yahweh. He is the great I Am. He knows all these things. Who is Yahweh? 
There is no one like him. Who is Yahweh? He is someone who's determined that one day all the nations will bow before him and pay him allegiance. Who is Yahweh? And you shall call his name Yehoshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is called the great I Am. Jesus says that he is Alpha and Omega. Jesus says he is the beginning and the end. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And Paul says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, that he is Yahweh, to the glory of God the Father. What is true of the Old Testament is true of the New. God is the Savior of all. He demands that all come to faith. No exceptions. You don't get a pass because you are part of the British Empire. You don't get a pass because you're maybe a, a, a superpower, a citizen of a superpower like America. You don't get a pass because you're Canadian and you're terribly tolerant. No. God says, I want the Canadian, bend your knee. I want the Rwandan, bend your knee. I want the Tanzanian, bend your knee. Your salvation is in a bent knee. You don't bend your knee, you don't get saved. Turn to me and be saved. Bend your knee. I don't want your praise. I want your submission. Then you can praise me. But do not praise me without bended knee. Bend your knee and acknowledge that apart from me, you have no other Savior. Bend your knee before Jesus. Turn and be saved all you peoples of the earth. I am so glad that this church helped Sharon and I go to Rwanda and help pastors get trained in helping their people understand the importance that they've been there. One of the guys who have one from Tanzania and they're just in the process of finishing his roof and his church class to start having his services. But he's had a Bible study Come to me. He's just a young kid. He seems like a kid to me. And he's just courageous like crazy. In Tanzania, many of them will tell him, Pastor, shut up. Pastor, go away. Pastor, we don't want to listen to you. Pastor, and he just pushes through. And he's got a wonderful church plan just on the horizon coming. Congregations there, I was told that. One of the churches in Canada is granting them all the money they need to finish the roof. And so in a few months, that church in Tanzania is off and right running. And I said, so how does it make you feel? He says, well, it's a good start, but there's 80 million of us. <laughs> I said, I hear you. That's twice the population of Canada. Let me just close again with a couple more verses, and then I'm done. It says this, only in the Lord... It shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. If you're against the Lord, you will come to nothing. Be on Jesus' side. And you'll never be put to shame. In the Lord, all the seed of Israel, including all the nations who trust in Christ, shall be justified and shall glory. Father God, we thank you for this time that we got to share. Thank you for the wonderful message of salvation. Thank you for our church that was able to give uh, money so that these pastors can have a theology book so necessary in a land that's got so much misunderstanding in theology. And also a, hermit, uh, a book on how to interpret Bible so that they can have some skills develop and, and when they teach and they preach. And uh, do thank you, Father. Uh, and also for the funds that we've been able to also give from here to help with this particular church plant that was on the screen. May you bless that pastor and the congregation as even now they're having dozens and dozens of Bible studies uh, in the village and they are packed and they are just longing for the day when they can go public and, uh, and have serious 
worship services with large choirs and see many, many people come to faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.